to be together for these things. Praise God. Please turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 3 this morning. Our message, the horse gate. The horse gate, Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 28. Nehemiah chapter 3. It's so vital, these truths that we're dealing with in this series on rebuilding the gates. I believe if ever we in the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, had to rebuild these gates, repair them, or protect them. It is now, in this hour, in this generation, never has there been such a confusion in the body of Christ. Never has there been such an overwhelming tide of moving away from the biblical gospel, biblical doctrine, and the biblical order of the church. The reason why there's ten gates and not... 12 gates in this chapter is because the number 10 stands for the order of God in the church. In other words, these gates are all about God putting order back into the church. What's been lost by the wear and down of the years of time of the devil working away, of the compromise of the people. We need to put these 10 gates back in again. And God help me, by the grace of God, these 10 gates are going to function in this church. We don't want to counterfeit. We don't want to just be looking at a nice gate without without it functioning properly. We don't want to read about things in past days. We want to function in church here this morning. We're dealing with the horse gate. Nehemiah chapter two, sorry, chapter three, verse twenty-eight. From above the horse gate repaired the priests, every one against his house. After them repaired Zadok the son of Amir over against his house. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your presence this morning, for the worship, the praise, the prayer gathering together in your name. We are, Lord God, here in the name of Jesus Christ. We do gather with one heart and with one desire, with one focus, even the person of Christ. And Father, we ask for your blessing on your word. We ask in agreement. We ask in unity and of heart that you might command your blessing. My God, I pray that you stir the spirit of your saints that you bring an awakening deep within us nor God that you wouldn't allow us to tolerate nor God all of the oppression of this flesh of the enemy and of the world of circumstance but that we had arise and build in this hour my God stir every heart in this room to arise and to build even this morning my God awaken the heart awaken the life let your word be as a life given word from your throne in the the mighty name of Jesus we love you this day amen. Amen. amen my message is the horse gate we have already dealt with over the past two weeks the fountain gate the water gate now the horse gate these three gates go very much together and the reason is because out of all of the ten gates that we have dealt with and are dealing with these three gates ensure more of a danger to the kingdom of Satan than any of the other gates. Let me say that again. These three gates endanger the kingdom of Satan like no other gates in this city. Remember we dealt with the fountain gate. It represents the baptism in the Holy Ghost. He said, I will give you power to be a witness and those who believe in me, they shall cast out demons, they shall take up serpents, they shall drink any deadly thing and it will not hurt them. The fountain gate, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is given to us to destroy the works of hell in this city amongst unbelievers. Saints, that is why it has suffered such an attack. That's why there's so much rubbish in around the fountain gate. Because when... You come back to the real baptism in the Holy Ghost. And I'm not talking about a tradition or a denomination. I am talking about the Word of God. A real endowment of power. Because I tell you, you can search this world. And there's very few who have touched God for an anointing of the Holy Ghost. A baptism of fire. But we the church need to get back to it. That's why the enemy has come in. That's why the enemy has played games in the pulpit of the church. We 
lost the Holy Spirit. We lost the anointing of God. We lost the touch of God's Holy Spirit. And now the enemy comes in like a flood. But one more time, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard. Since the devil hates the fountain gate, it is the power of God, the unction of God, the leading of God. But secondly, the water gate that we dealt with last week, the devil hates the water, water gate. And the water gate, remember what we said, represents the ministry of God's yeah. word in the church. There's yeah. nothing breaks the strongholds of the devil, breaks the lies of the devil, like the ministry of God's word. I tell you this morning, I'm here doing warfare. Yeah. I, I don't need to bind some demon over Limerick. Yeah. I am here in spiritual warfare. If you want to see true warfare, you'll see it operate in this pulpit every yeah. time I'm preaching. Yeah. I am fighting the lies of hell. I am fighting the discouragements he brings against you. I am making a stand against the ideologies that he has imparted. You see, the word of God, the ministry of God's word in the church endangers his ground in the lives of believers or of sinners. That's why it's so devastating to his kingdom. But we come third of all to the horse gate, the fountain gate, the water gate, now the horse gate. There's no gate that endangers the kingdom of Satan like the horse gate. When we read in the Bible, if you think of animals, and we're dealing with an animal here, it is the horse gate. It actually has a connotation, a connection to the horse. Without understanding the horse or what the horse means in the Bible, you will not understand what the horse gate means in the church, in our life, or in this local assembly. It was called the horse gate because the horse represents something in the Bible. Do you remember what the donkey means in the Bible? The donkey or the ass is actually a symbol of peace. If you see someone coming on a donkey, I can assure you they're not coming to do war. Yeah, they're amen. there on a message. Uh, they're there as a messenger of peace. It says in Zechariah chapter 9 in the Old Testament, prophesying about the coming Messiah, that when he would come unto Jerusalem, he would come riding on a donkey or an ass. He would actually come on that little uh, fool or coal or that young donkey. He would literally be riding upon it when he would come as the Messiah. Now listen to me. That is is a symbol of peace. When you see the Messiah riding on a donkey, coming into Jerusalem, he's not coming to do war. He is coming as a messenger of peace. He is coming with a message of peace and reconciliation. When in the Gospels, when we see Jesus ride into Jerusalem, all the little children ran out. They weren't scared of him. Here comes the Messiah on the back of a donkey and they praised Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, they began to worship him and adore him and they threw palms out before him as he came into Jerusalem. That's how Christ rode into Jerusalem the very first time. He came on a donkey because it represented peace. He was coming saying peace peace. I am the messenger of peace. I'll bring peace to your life. Come unto me all you that are weak and heavy laden and I will give you rest for your soul. But when you go over to Revelation chapter 9 concerning the return of Jesus Christ, listen to what it says in verse 11. And it says, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war what does the horse represent it represents war just as the donkey represents peace the horse represents war when I see Christ coming on a donkey he's coming with peace to that city when I see Christ on a white horse it means he's coming to judge he's coming to make war he's coming to deal with his enemies he's going to put down all opposition no man is going to stand on that day it 
It says that in the last days Christ will come again. He's not coming as a man of peace. He's not coming as a peacemaker. I can assure you he's coming as a man of war. And the Bible depicts him riding on a white horse to make judgment against his enemies. It goes further and says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Christ is going to come with a white horse. The armies of heaven are going to come on white horses. And I can assure you we are going to be with them on that day. The Bible says we shall come with them. It's not us coming without him. That can never happen. Neither will it be him coming without us. It says when he comes we shall Come with them. And saints notice the white horse. That white horse isn't a symbol of peace. It is a symbol. A righteous symbol of war. Against sin. Against darkness. Against the devil. Yeah. And believe me. When you see that white horse. You know the Lord is going to deal with yeah. every enemy. It also says. And out of the mouth of the rider of that white horse. Goeth forth a sharp sword. Now with it he might smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. When Jesus comes back he's not coming back for a picnic. He's not coming back to play games. He's not coming to entertain people. He's not coming to try and woo people into some belief in God. He is actually coming with an iron rod. He's going to put down all opposition. He's going to deal with every demon of hell. The, the devil is going to be bound and cast into hell for a thousand years. But since when he comes, no enemy is going to stand. No work of wickedness is going to stand. He is going to bring in everlasting righteousness. He will bring in everlasting peace. And the only question is, are you ready yes. for such a coming yes. of the Lord? Right. Remember and note that the horse is a symbol of war. When you see that horse, it says in Proverbs 20, 21 verse 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle yeah. but safety is of the Lord listen that again the horse is prepared against the day of battle do you realize for thousands of years until our technical age thousands of years world history was dictated by a military horse yeah. by the horse of war by by men cavalry units who use the horse to conquer empires kingdoms whole nations whole continents since yeah. that is the history of our world yeah. if you got a great leader a tyrant who could have enough men that were trained in the use of that horse they knew how to use it they could conquer any a kingdom yeah, on the yeah. face of the earth that's what Genghis Khan done all the way from Asia all the way through to Europe he conquered every nation because it was an overwhelming tide of cavalry men they, each one of those men knew how to master that horse they had disciplined that horse that horse was an extension of them it was a part of them they slept with it they lived with it yeah, they yeah. treated it like another part of their life yeah. the Bible says that the horse is prepared against the day of battle. The horse always represents the day of battle, warfare, or coming to do battle on behalf of the Lord. There is a type and a spiritual picture here. Over in Zechariah in chapter 10, it begins talking in verse 1 about, Ask ye the Lord reign in the time of the latter rain. Yeah. It's talking about prayer. It's talking about asking God for revival. Yeah. It's actually asking Lord will you send the latter rain. Yeah. It's time for revival. It's time for the latter rain. Yeah. It's time for a move of God. Yeah. It's too dark in our earth. Yeah. The enemy is devastated all around him. Jerusalem is in a terrible state. Will you send this rain? Yeah. Will you send us revival? Will you come to us just one more time but listen carefully saints in verse 3 what it says after that it actually says concerning his flock 
that he is going to visit his sheep. He's going to visit his people and has made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. In the midst of a revival, in the midst of God coming to his sheep again. Do you hear who I'm talking to? I'm talking to sheep, born again believers. Yeah. I, I tell you, those who have really become the sheep of God, in the midst of God coming again, he actually takes the sheep and he makes them into his goodly horse in the battle. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. In the midst of God moving, he takes all of his sheep and he makes them into horses of war Amen. or horses of battle. Do you hear me yeah. this morning? I'm going to say it again. Yeah. In the midst of God moving, even if it's in a small way in a local church, as soon as the Spirit of God begins to stir and begins to move, I tell you, those sheep in that local church may suddenly become horses of war. Yeah. They say, I'm tired of the enemy walking over me. I'm tired of him trampling my family underfoot. I'm tired of what he's doing in Limerick city. Amen. I tell you, those sheep can become a horse of war as the Spirit of God begins to move. I do yeah, feel yeah, like yeah. something like a horse yeah. this morning. I, I feel that yeah. that hoof is going. Yeah. I'm not a lamb this morning. I'm not a sheep but I'm a horse made ready for battle. I'm here to battle saints yes. of God. Yeah. I'm here in the will of God yeah. to do warfare against the lies of hell yeah. and the workings of the enemy. Yes. I am angry yeah. at what the devil is doing in life. Yes. I'm tired of what the world is doing in the life. I want to see a revival one more time. You see, God spiritually changes his sheep into horses of war. We read in the Old Testament that Israel actually never had horses amidst their army until King David and King Saul came. We read in the days of or King Solomon, we read about in the days of King Solomon that he had 40,000 stalls of horses. Do you hear that? 40, not 40,000 horses, but stalls for the houses. And he had 12,000 horsemen. And he had a thousand and four hundred chariot saints. What am I telling you? This is King Solomon, the man of peace. This is King Solomon who extended the boundaries of Israel greater than any other king. This is a man who reigned for 40 years and he had no war. I wonder why. It's because the cavalry were so great numbering into tens of thousands. Who is going to stand against them? You're, you're going to think very carefully before you go to war with Solomon. He was a man of peace. He brought peace. But I assure you, that peace was brought by force and through the number of his army. You see, he had all of those horses. The horse represents and the horse gate represents our warfare against the enemy Amen. as a Christian. Can I say that again? The horse gate represents our warfare in this church. That's why it's so important and that's why it will endanger the kingdom of Satan. If this gate, this Horse gate is operating in this church. If it is here in this church, yeah. saints, it's at the horse gate. We're going to turn the battle against the enemy. Yeah. Are you tired this morning? Yeah. Are you tired of the thoughts? Are you tired of the wearing down? Are you tired of the circumstance? Then don't give up. Just get fired up again. Come to yeah. this gate. Let's say, let's ask the Lord, turn me into a steed of war. Yeah. Turn me into a white horse. I know I'm a lamb. I know it can whimper in the corner at times when the trials come. But Lord, will you do a work of the Holy Spirit to make me into a horse that will trample over the enemy? Did Jesus not say this? That you shall trample on scorpions? Yes. That you'll take up serpents? Why are we running then, saints? Why are we like cowards? Why is there no heart to fight in us anymore? Why is it we're always tired, ready to give up? Why not begin to fight again? You see, God is is going to put that heart back in the church. This horse gate, Nehemiah knew the horse gate has to be back in its place. It has to operate and it's got to function. Not just a physical gate, but Nehemiah knew that this horse gate has to be operative 
amongst those men on the wall, those who are building, those who love God. This horse gate has to function in the church again. You see, there was a lot of people in the city of Jerusalem. They weren't building on those gates. They weren't repairing. They weren't putting bricks back in the wall. They weren't stirred in heart by Nehemiah. There was many in that city who were not part of the rebuilding work. Yeah. Many of them were not revived in heart. I mean believers. I mean those that were of Israel. I mean those that had a certificate of birth in the city of Jerusalem or amongst the people of God. You see, there was literally thousands in that city, but they were not affected by Nehemiah. Many in that, that city were not soldiers. And when we look at this gate, I'm talking about being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It's pictured as a horse, but what you are is you become a soldier of Jesus Christ. There's many in the church today. Oh, they're Christians. They do love Jesus. They have been forgiven. They have got in through fish gate. They are in, in, in through, well, in through uh, sheep gate and fish yeah. gate. They have come in, saints of God. They yeah. do love God, but they haven't been made soldiers of Jesus Christ. Yeah. There's no backbone. There's no training. There's no discipline. There's no faithfulness. There's no courage. There's no fearfulness. And those are all the marks of a horse in war. Yeah. Do you know what you you can do with those horses that are trained for war. Bombs going in around them, they'll keep going wherever you tell them. Yeah. They're not scared of the bombs. They're not scared of death. They're not scared of anything. Wherever that rider says go, that's where they're going to go. They have courage, saints of God. Yeah. They have stamina. They're going to keep going. They have obedience. They have submission. They are under the control of a rider. And that horse represents you and me and as being good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Not every Christian has been trained to be a soldier. Yeah. Not every Christian, not every preacher, can you say they're a good soldier yeah, right, of right. Jesus Christ. Sadly, in our day, there's very few that you can say he's an old rugged warrior. Yeah, I thank yeah, God, yeah. Brother Clendenin, if ever there was a general in the army of God, that man was a soldier. Yeah, he yeah. was a spiritual general. He had all the characteristics of this horse. When I looked at him, watched him, listened to him over those years, I went, he is like a beautiful steed or a beautiful white horse that tramples the enemy underfoot. And no matter what the bombshells, just charge at the enemy. Just get up, keep charging, yeah. keep going. If everyone else leaves the battlefield, he keeps on going. You see, there was many in that city. There were some who, yes, they loved the Lord. Yes, they believed the word. But they become so compromised with intermarriage, with all of the faults, the counterfeit, the unreal, the enemies of God. There were those in that city that weren't on the wall. They weren't building any gate. They hadn't chosen any gate to rebuild. Why? Because they were bound and joined to other people. Their daughters were married to unbelievers. Believers, their, 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 their personal friendships were so entangled that they couldn't leave that or get victory to go work on the wall. But there were those on the walls. Their daughters had left, went and married a pagan, but he was there on that wall. She was there on that wall. And they said, I will build, God help me. I'm free from that. Yeah. There were others in that city and they believed in the status quo. Do you know what status quo means? It means just keep everything as it is. Yeah. That statement was invented in the 14th century. It's a Latin term. Now listen to what it means. Keep the state of things just as it was before the war. In other words, pretend there is no war. Don't, don't allow the war to affect you. Let's go back to as if there's no war, there's no enemy, there's no battle. Let's just settle down. You see, those who want the status quo, they say, I just want to settle down into a peaceful life. What did Nehemiah say? No, those gates need to go back. The wall needs to go up. The enemy needs 
needs to go out. It's not business as normal. We are living in a day of war. It says they didn't take their clothes off. Why? They're in a battle. Saints, we're in a war. We're not here for a picnic. I'm not here to entertain you. Souls are dying and going to hell. There's people coming in this door. They are having a raging battle over their souls. Hell is after them. God is after them. It is raging this morning. And saints, I'm not here for a picnic. I am in a bloody war. It's time to keep your boots on. Keep your rifle between your legs. That's what you do as a soldier. You know in wartime, if that rifle is ever found outside your sleeping bag, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. You bear hope it's your sergeant and not your enemy. If it's your sergeant, he'll kick you. Maybe uh, have you shot or something if, if it's a war. But saints, you sleep with your rifle entwined in your body. Why? It's a war. You sleep with your boots on. Why? It's a war, saints of God. And we are at war in this city. I'm tired. We're not here in peacetime. We're not here for celebrations. There are multitudes in this city. The devil is working. The devil knows about this church. The devil knows about you. He knows what you've been praying for. He knows what we're praying for on these Friday nights. He knows what we desire. And saints, he's going to hit us like we are going to hit him. Amen. You see, you had all these people there in the city of Jerusalem. You even had a house church filled with prophets. They're there saying, whoa, they're going to kill you, Nehemiah. Whoa, we know the will of God. No, you false prophets. You've got money in your pockets from Sinbalat and Tobiah. Yeah. You've been bought. You're compromised. That's why you're not on these walls. You want to be a little meetings prophesying over everybody. Everybody's a prophet. It's all prophetic ministry every meeting. You know why? You're compromised. You should have been a dung gate. You should have been a fish gate. But oh no, all you see is prophecy. And your prophecies are false. All of this was in the city. There were also those who were just plain downright scared. Have you ever got scared? I have. Amen. Have you ever got worried in a battle? I have saints. It's common to us all. But there's those who through fear, scared of the enemy, scared of their own failure, they stay at home. Remember the man who was given one talent by Christ, by the Lord, by his master. One man got one, one ten, one more. And that one man who got one, he says, Now I knew you'd get angry if I didn't do something with this. And the master says, well, why didn't you do something? He just buried it. And that man was scared, bound by fear. But I might fail. I might lose it. What if it doesn't happen? Well, you're going to suffer because you buried it and said, I'll hold on to it. Why didn't you risk it in order to make it greater? There are some Christians, they're so scared they'll lose a lot on this journey. They will lose their crown. They will lose rewards. If they make it to heaven, they're going to lose an awful lot. But saints, fear can bind you. Fear can take you out of the prayer meeting. Fear can take you off the streets. Fear can take you out of the church. Fear can cripple you that you're no longer useful in the house of God. You're not a good soldier. You're not a horse of war. There you are. You're a coward. You're Amen. feeble. You're weak. You're useless. And believe me, you can get a young saint who has a lot of fears. I tell you, they're trembling. But to fear God more. Amen. And because of that fear of God, they overcome their own weaknesses. Amen. I was a young man bound by fear. I tell you, I was scared of everything. I had a thousand inabilities but the fear of God made me to overcome that you see there are those who have no heart no courage no conviction no stickability in the church of God I'm going to tell you you might make it to heaven you might be a sheep but you're not a soldier of Jesus Christ this iron the church requires soldiers yeah. we, we are the real the real church does get discouraged. Yeah. It does get weary. It does get tired. It does feel like throwing the towel in. But at some point they rise up and say, I'm a soldier. Yeah. I've got my sword in hand. I've got my shield of faith. I almost feel like packing it in. But not today. Praise yeah. God. I will arise. I am going to fight the king's battle. It's not a man that we're fighting for. It's the Lord's battle. It says in 2 Corinthians 10 and 3, 
For though we walk in the flesh, and listen to this, I'm talking about thousands in Jerusalem, and there was only a handful working on the walls. I'm talking about thousands who said, I'm Israel, I'm born again, I love the Lord, but only a handful working on the walls. Why is it? Because of this. They lost the battle in their mind. They, they weren't on those walls because they lost a battle that took them away from the walls, bound by fear, wrong teaching, indifference, apathy, status quo. It took them away from the real work of God. It's a battle of the mind, saints. That's where the real warfare is. That's where the warfare in your life is. It's not a strong demon over Limerick that you need to worry about. It's the little thoughts in your mind. It's the attitudes of heart. It's the things that get whispered in your ears. It's what you believe or what you reject. That's where your battle is. That's why Paul in 2 Corinthians 10. He says for though we walk in the flesh. Though we walk in the flesh the natural man. We don't war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. And listen this carefully. Well, what are they? They are mighty through God to the pulling down of demons. No. Doesn't say that, does it? No. Of strong holes in the heavenly places. Doesn't say that. Mm. It says our spiritual weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strong holes. And I'll explain what it is. What is a stronghold? It's talking about your life in your mind and in your heart. It is a place of great strength. It's little thoughts come together and they create a strong fortified castle within your life, within your mind yeah. that seems unbreakable. That's what a stronghold is. But the Bible says you can have a stronghold, a strong castle of fear or discouragement or oppression or of hopelessness or of sinfulness yeah. and you can have it pulled down saints of God it says the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to pull down every stronghold yeah. it says in your life every place saints think of it this morning where is the stronghold in your life your life personally where is that castle that you cannot assail the walls of it is unbreakable it seems insurmountable where is it? What is it? Well, I want to tell you, the weapons of our warfare are not natural. They're not carnal. They are mighty through God to pull it down. Saints, it can come down. It must come down. Rise up as a good soldier and say, I'll assail that castle that comes down. I might have failed. I got discouraged. I thought it couldn't happen. But I'm after that castle. Not one castle. Am I thinking, it is going to come down. The devil says, no, it will never come down. I'll say, yes, it will. Hallelujah. This will decide whether you're a soldier or just a sheep. It also says casting down imaginations. So it's not dealing with demons or powers of darkness. It's your mind casting down imaginations. What's the imagination? It's where all those thoughts go on. And you ever, you ever seen, you ever played out a scenario in your mind? And this one, it hasn't happened yet. All you see is your doom. Blub, 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 as you sink below the water. You're imagining your defeat. You're thinking about it. You're, tur you're, you're turning it over. Yeah. And the Bible says you've got to cast those down. Yeah. You've got to cast down the imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Do you realize where the warfare is? It's not binding a demon. Yeah. And I'm going to keep saying that a few times. Not binding a demon. It is actually... Casting down everything that exalts itself in your mind, in your heart, in your life over the knowledge of God. There's actually a warfare in your life between the knowledge of God and other high things. Yeah. Is there anything that comes to your mind and heart and it's a high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God? You know who God is. You know what his word says. But there is something exalted above it that makes this powerless. 
Then since the Bible says you need to cast it down, you need to pull it down, you need to exalt the true knowledge of God. Since it's a war yeah. and you are the battlefield, there is a war going on in each of your hearts and your minds. Yeah. And I'm helping you in that war this morning. I'm here as a steed. I'm here with my sword and, and shield and everything else. I'm here in my battle armor. I'm not here to entertain you, to take you on a picnic or anything else. We are going to war. I'm going to put you on that wall. I'm going to stir your heart to build those gates again by God's grace. And it says bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of God. What do you do? You bring every thought into obedience to Christ. To the person of Christ. It's a thought saint. You'll either win this battle or lose this battle. Depending on a thought. One simple thought. It begins in your mind. It gets into your heart. It gets into your life. It gets into your speech. It gets into your ideology. Since I'm talking about the real warfare for the mind of a believer. For the heart of a believer. For the conviction of a believer. I have watched over the past 15 years. The convictions of many changed radically. I watch people with great convictions. Ten years later, they're like an utterly different person. I go, what's happened to them? All their convictions changing. All their ideas changing. All their holiness principles changing. They got defeated in the battle. Now they've become a part of the problem. They're not on the wall anymore. They're not building anymore. They're not fighting the enemy anymore. They've merged into the scenery. They have become a part of the curse part of the problem but saints many of them are still believers yeah. they do love the Lord they do want the Lord but they've just gone got worn down by the enemy we read an interesting story in 2nd Kings and 2nd Chronicles about the wicked queen Athaliah Athalia. The Bible actually calls her that wicked lady. She was the daughter of Jezebel. Now listen to me for a moment. The kingdom of Israel was split from Judah. In the north, the ten tribes of Israel. In the south was the two tribes of Judah. That's where Jerusalem was. The northern kingdom usually represents the compromised church or the apostate church. The kingdom in the south usually represents the true remnant church in every generation. Now we actually read about the days of King Jehoshaphat. He was a godly man, a man of prayer, a man of faith, a man who really loved the Lord. He was the king of the southern kingdom. But do you know what happened? He got tired of the fight. He was a man who truly loved the Lord, but with all the fighting, all the wearying, all that the enemy come against him, he got tired of years of strife, years of division, always having to fight the enemies in the north. It was King Ahab who was the king in the north. Ahab married Jezebel, that wicked queen of the northern kingdom. She was a evil woman. And we know about Ahab. He was just a weak man yeah, and yeah, she yeah. controlled him and she manipulated him. In that northern kingdom, they brought in false worship false ideology and they pushed the prophets of God out. They wouldn't tolerate a genuine prophet in any pulpit in the land in the north of Israel. But do you know what happened? Jehoshaphat in the south got tired and he started a relationship with Ahab. After years of fighting and being separate, Ahab and Jehoshaphat come into an agreement. And how they do that is Jezebel's daughter marries Jehoshaphat's son who was called Jehoram. So they come to peace, they unified through this marriage. In this sense it seems like a small compromise. Jehoshaphat is a great and a godly man but he's just compromising. He does love the Lord. He does desire the Lord. He does live for the Lord. The Lord blesses him. But since the compromise come in, that he stopped fighting the Lord's battle. Amen. He did believe in the Lord. He was right with the Lord, but so wrong before the Lord. He began to bring compromise into the southern kingdom. It started small with the 
wife of his own son. It seemed a small thing to get peace, yeah. to stop the warfare, to live in unity. Just let your son marry the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab. Mm. And we have peace. We have unity. We all agree together. We'll fight the same battles. We'll go fight the enemy out there. But we are all one now. What a tragedy, saints. It always starts with a small yeah. Compromise in the church of God. Well, we read that King Jehoshaphat actually died. Jehoram become the king, was only the king for one year. And in the northern kingdom, amazingly, a revival broke out. We read of the, the man Jehu being raised up to be the king of the northern kingdom. The most godly king of the north. Since what a change in the apostate church, revival is breaking out. Jehu rises up, he kills everyone. Every false prophet, he's after Jezebel, he's going to destroy the enemy, he's bringing the nation back to God. This is meant to be the old apostate denominations. Amen. That would be like revival breaking out in the Catholic Church and, and there's the Pentecostal movement going down into deep darkness. That's what it would be like. Jehu arose up with great zeal. He was a soldier of the Lord. He's destroying everything. He's not showing any mercy. He's not given any room to the enemy. What's happening in the south? Jehoram is the king. One year and Jehu kills him. You see that revival is now moving into the southern kingdom yeah, and yeah. King Jehoram is killed. Why? He's a compromiser. Do you know how he lived during that year? He promoted true worship. He, he went and listened to good preaching. He, he believed in the real prophets. He actually said, I believe in the old time gospel. I believe in the blood and the cross. I believe in holiness. He said all of that. But his own wife, Athaliah, his own wife is influencing him and his baby son. She is a wicked lady. She has room in there. But he's trying to merge it all, isn't he? He's trying to bring it all together. No fight within him. No courage within him. No conviction within him. They're, it's being destroyed, saints of God, by that wicked lady, Athaliah. In the northern kingdom, we read that Jehu finally tracked Jezebel, her mother, down to Jezreel. When he got to Jezreel, he said, Elijah's prophecy is going to be fulfilled about Jezebel. That old man of God, Elijah, he prophesied that her blood is going to be shed at Jezreel and the dogs are going to lick up her blood. And he said, I will be an instrument of that. I'm against the enemy. I'm against Jezebel. Who are you against this morning? Oh, I'm not against anyone. Yeah. Then you're not a soldier. Yeah. You may be a Christian, but you're not a very good soldier. I can assure you I can tell you what I'm against. There are some preachers I'm against. There are things going on in the church I'm against it saints. And you know what? So many are tired of fighting like Jehoshaphat. I'm worn out. Why do we have to fight? Why all the bickering? I'm weary. How long is this going to go on? Until you get home saints of God. Until the day you breathe your last breath. There is a warfare until my last breath. This isn't my holiday camp. I I have a promised eternity with my Savior. Yeah. I will have a day of rest, but yeah. it's not today. Yeah. Today is a day of battle, a day of war. Yeah. Don't get tired. Don't get fatigued. We are just in the battle. When he tracked Jezebel down to Jezreel, She's in a tar. She hears he's coming. This man of God, uncompromising, with holy conviction, what does she do? She puts on makeup. The first mention of makeup in the Bible ever. And Jezebel's putting on her makeup. Why? Because a man of God's coming. What's she going to do? Have to deceive him. Have to make him appear. And let my beauty do its work. When the church begins to do that, there are problems. Yeah. There are issues. Well, we'll just turn on the nice smile. We'll turn on the fragrance. When he reached there, he wasn't interested in her makeup. He looked up. He spoke to the concubines. Her concubines, who are they? They're emasculated men. They're men who could have been soldiers. Men who could have fought the battles, but they've been emasculated. They're not men anymore. She actually took away their manhood, and now they're servants to Jezebel. He looks up and he said, you concubines, throw her down. 
You see, God is moving. They all rise up, take her, cast her out, and she falls to her death. Do you know how she dies? Under the hoofs of Jehu's horse, he tramples her to death. Saints of God, he's there as a man of war. Jezebel died under the hoofs of a great horse, under righteousness. It was judgment against sin. Jezebel died. That's in the northern kingdom. What happened in the southern kingdom? Jehoram only reigned for one year. Then he's killed. Well, as the... As the El, she began to reign. She ruled for six years as queen. You realize she's the only queen in Israel in all of its history. There was no other queen ever who ruled over the nation, either in the north or the south. She is the only queen in the entire kingdom in all of its history that ever gained that position. And she's a wicked lady. Do you know what she does for six years? This is meant to be God's remnant. Yeah. This is in the city of Jerusalem. Yeah. For six years she hunts down every line of David's seed what's she looking for that godly line yeah. those, those with real blood flowing in their veins and she kills every little child every man, every cousin every brother, every daughter he, she literally has them all killed one by one until she thinks there's none left and I'm the rightful queen. For six years she reigns like this in charge of the kingdom in wickedness. Do you know how it came to an end? A revival came to the city. A spiritual revival. The priests rose up. Listen this carefully. The priests rose up and the soldiers rose up. And the priests and the soldiers joined forces and they brought out of hiding the last seed, the last child. Hallelujah. You see, there was one she had missed, and that's what the enemy does. He never quite manages it. He tries to destroy the real church, tries to destroy the real preaching of the word. He's trying to destroy the remnant in this hour. Do you know what? There is going to come out of hiding a seed. After the six years of onslaught, a holy seed is going to come forth. What did the soldiers and the priests do? They snaked him into the temple. Yeah. They divided in three. The priests stood around him. They put soldiers in around that place, all with swords in their hands. Said, anyone tries to come in here, you kill them. Doesn't matter who it is. We are anointing the king of yeah. Jerusalem and Israel again. We do have a king. He's only a young boy, but he'll soon grow up. He wants righteousness. Anything's better than that old girl on the throne. We are going to turn it against the enemy. Saints, we are in a warfare. We can and turn this battle again. The battle seems to be against us. We're always losing. Why is it six years? Everybody's done. Everybody's falling away. They're all backsliding. There's no answer to prayer. Where's the blessing? No revival. It's doom, doom, doom. The devil's saying it's over. Not yet, saints of God. It is time to rise up and anoint the king of Israel one last time to reign in his church. Do you know what happens as they're there and they begin to shout and pray He's got a revival's broke out in the temple again. The, the soldiers and the priests and they're shouting and they get the instruments out and they're going, there's victory in the house of God again. Amen. Old Queen Athalia, you know what? She heard it and she went running, going, what's going on here? I haven't heard that sound in years. I, I haven't heard that type of thing. I don't believe in those old hymns. They're singing those old hymns. We're now in the contemporary worship. Um, don't mention Jesus. Don't mention the blood. Uh, make it all sensual. Have young girls in scanty clad clothes there. Uh, Athiala must have had all her worship teams there. Flashing lights going. Who's singing? Abide with me down in the temple. Who's singing? There's power in the blood. We don't believe in that anymore. She goes running down there. And do you know what to do? The high priest says, take her. Don't kill her in the house of God. Take her to Horsegate. Do you hear me? Amen. Take her out to horse gate. Don't kill her in here. Take her to the horse gate and kill her. The soldiers take her out to horse gate and they kill her. And the revival commences from horse gate. Saints, we need a horse gate back in the church again. Please note with me as we close chapter 328. It says, from above the horse gate, they repair, repaired the priest's. 
everyone over against his house. Do you realize these priests and Nehemiah knew about the story of Athaliah? Do you realize these priests who are repairing this horse gate know that her blood was shed at this gate? Do you know that they must have talked as they're working in around this gate and saying, do you know what this gate represents? Our warfare against the enemy. Cleaning up the church of God again. That we're not going to give things over. We're not going to give up. We're not throwing the talent. Yeah. We are going to be a wild horse, a stallion. Jezebel died under the hoose of a horse. Athiala, uh, she died at Horsegate. We are in a warfare, saints. Our job will never be finished until the coming of the king on the white horse. Yes. Now look here at these points. It says the priests built here. The same priesthood that killed her, here they are repairing. What does the word repair mean? It means to be obstinate. It means a lot of things. It means to seize, make your choice. To establish, prevail, to strengthen, to have courage. But it does mean obstinate. Yeah. I am going to be obstinate at the horse game. Yeah. Are you going to lie down, die, give up? No, I'm not. Amen. I'm going to get up one more time. Amen. Lord, help me to get up again. It's the Lord's battle and I'm going to fight. Notice it says they repaired above. Do you know where their houses were? Remember this is the hill of Ophiel inside. It was a high place and their homes were above the gate. They looked down upon the gate. That's where they lived. They lived at this gate. Their homes were attached to this gate. Everything that happened at this gate affected their homes. It says everyone over against his home. Every single priest. Do you realize we're all priests? Don't, don't begin to call each other father um, <laughs> over lunch. But the Bible says a true born again believer is a priest. We are a royal priesthood. We are a nation of priests, saints of God. We don't have a priest over us apart from King Jesus. He is my high priest. But notice it was all, every one of these priests rose up. Their houses are there. They're saying, I'm fighting for my home. I'm fighting for my wife. I'm fighting for my children. I'm fighting for my parents. I'm fighting for my cousins, Amen. my brothers, my sisters. Amen. This horse gate has everything to do with my home. There is a war. Yeah. Since do you have a, a war going on in your home, in your family, in loved ones' lives? It is at this gate that we win the victory. Amen. Every house is actually over against it. Notice in verse 21. It says, And them repaired Zadok, the son of Amir, over against his house. Zadok, his name means righteousness or holiness. And his father's name means talkative. And that sounds bad until you realize it means he had said. I believe Demer was a man who spoke the word of God. Do you know what the gate that comes before this warfare gate is the water gate, the word gate. Yeah. Without the word you won't have a good warfare. Yeah. Unless you're standing on the word of God. Unless you've really put the word of God into your life. You will not be able to stand against the enemy. Or to war a good warfare. And that's what Sadik means. His father was a man of the word of God. The Bible says. The Bible says. Yeah. He, was all, he was talking. Of, he, he's always talking what the word of God says. You know some people get tired. Don't. Every time you speak to me, you mention the Bible. Yeah, because the Bible says to. That's the only answer I have. You see, his father was talkative about the Word of God. And he produced a holy son who actually labored in around the gate, repairing it, fixing it, putting courage back into the house of God, saying, we will defeat the enemy. We will arise and defeat the enemy. Do you know what McShane, that... Man of God died when he was 28, 29 years old. A young man of prayer that brought revival to Scotland. Listen to what he says. He says, a holy man. Let me say that again. A holy man is a dreadful 
and a terrible weapon in the hand of God. Yeah. Do you hear me? In spiritual warfare, a holy man or a holy woman is a terrible weapon in the hand of God. Give God a holy life, he'll destroy the enemy. Unholy life will never stand against the enemy. You know all these big conventions, people bind and loosen, rebuking the enemy. They're not holy. Yeah. Amen. They're, they're, they're biggest gossips. I, yeah. I used to know people, you'd sit in a room with them, gossiping, talking like that about everyone, ridiculing, criticizing. They're the ones who always felt the anointing. I feel the anointing. They're always the ones rebuking the devil. Amen. They're always the ones saying, I bind you, devil. And I'm sitting thinking, hold on. Yeah. You have no control over your tongue. Yeah. There's no holiness in your life. But you think the devil's going to listen to you? Yeah. No way. I don't even listen to you. I can see that you're a hypocrite. You've got no control over your tongue. I bind you, Satan. The devil laughs at that. Amen. The devil says, I've got you bound with an ideology of gossip, of criticism. You think it's okay. You, you carry on thinking you're fine. No, the devil's played a game on you. He's actually put that in your mind. Your brain is affected by it you're not free but you're binding the devil binding loosen rebuking breaking generational curses looking for freemasons marches for jesus and a thousand other things but yet you've got no holiness in your life it is a joke saints of god listen to philemon philemon chapter 1 verse 2 paul writing to philemon to a house that met or to a church that met in a house and he mentions one brother. He mentions Archippus, our fellow soldier. Who's Archippus? He's a fellow soldier. What did Paul mean? He says, now, when, make sure you, when you read the letter out, greet Archippus, my fellow, our fellow soldier. Archippus is a soldier. Amen. Paul looked at him and said one mark about his life. He is my fellow laborer. He's fighting the battle. He is a real soldier. If there's one man is a good soldier of Jesus Christ, it is Archippus. Listen to what Archippus means in the Greek. It means horse ruler. Or one who has the ability to control the horse under him. One who has trained the horse, disciplined the horse, who rides on a horse. Is it an accident that Archippus is called a fellow soldier? No. He is riding that horse. He is a man of war. He's not given into the devil. There's one man in that church who says, I'm not giving ground to the enemy. I'm not compromising. I'm not rolling over. I'm playing dead. Paul writes as we close second Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. One of these nights we're going to be like Paul, preach all night long. You, you might fall asleep, I'll just keep on Amen. preaching. Yes. But I'll wait until we're in revival. Amen. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. And Paul speaking to the church to young Timothy, that young preacher. He says, young Timothy, you listen to me. You see in his letters he said, Timothy, Fight a good fight. Yeah. War a good war. Yeah. Here in chapter 2 he says, Thou therefore, Timothy, listen to me. Thou therefore endure hardness. Yeah. If you're going to be a soldier, you'll have to endure hardness. Yeah. What does that mean? Let hell come against you and you'll still stand. That's right. You've got hardships around you and disappointments, but you're still there in prayer. Yeah. The enemy has wounded you, but you're still there fighting for others. You're going to rise up. Timothy, listen to me. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A good soldier. Endure hardness. And no man that warreth himself entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. You're going to have to be single-minded. You're going to have to be dedicated to this. Saints have got a lot more to say. But we are in a battle. We are to be those horses. I believe God wants to fix this horse gate again. He wants to raise us up to say we will trample Jezebel, Athetalia and anyone else who's going to compromise this gospel. We're going to keep riding until that day when that white stayed, that beautiful white horse comes with the word of God seated. Out of his mouth is going to come a two-edged sword. He'll trample underfoot every enemy, every opposition, every worker of iniquity. And he'll bring in everlasting righteousness. Please stand with me this morning. Hallelujah.
Oh, thank you, my God. Hallelujah. Oh, let's lift up our hands. Let's just.